Hey guys, I'm Joshua with the Rocky Mountain and look who decided to show up back from the grave. It's the KLR 650, new for 2022. Uh, we thought we had seen the last of the KLR when it was discontinued back in 2018. We even did a life and death history of the KLR video and we may have called that one wrong. Now, lucky for us, the pig, the jack of all trades, master of none, two wheel Jeep, tractor, killer, curly, whatever your nickname is for this thing, it's back. Now with the 2022 model, you've got four options for the KLR. So you've got the base model, which we have here. You've got a model with ABS. You've also got a model that's called the Traveler model, as well as the Adventure model. Now the price ranges from $6,700 to $8,000 MSRP. Now with the new KLR, there is a lot of improvements and a lot of changes they've actually made. And at the same time, it's still kind of the same old KLR that we've grown to love over the years. Now, Kawasaki, it does seem like they were just trying to improve long range comfort. Now, some of the most notable changes with the new KLR is you've got an updated styling, and then the big one is that it moved to fuel injection. So we're gonna get on the bike here in a little bit. We're gonna test that out and see if it is an improvement from the old carburetor. Uh, it's nice that it passes emissions now, which is why the old KLR was discontinued in the first place. Uh, other notable changes, we've got rubber mounted controls all over the place. We've got a digital display. We've got an adjustable and upgraded windscreen. We've got uh, output of the stator is improved. We've got better brakes. We've got an optimized suspension. Um, and Kawasaki even has uh, OEM accessories that you can get with your machine now as well. Now with the new KLR, there is some things that they didn't change as well as some things that they changed, but maybe not for the better. If you know the KLR, some of these might be a little bit of disappointing, but here they are. So first off is the doohickey spring. So. I guess they still haven't upgraded the doohickey spring. It's got the upgraded doohickey from Gen 2, but the spring is still junk. So we've talked to Eagle Mike already, and it sounds like doing the spring upgrade is gonna be something you're going to wanna do with your Gen 3. Also, they got rid of the tachometer as well as the temp sensor on the new gauge. So there is some aftermarket options, it sounds like, that are getting worked out. So you can add a temp sensor to your bike, um, but that is something you're missing out on. Now the last is while in the grave, it seems like the KLR swelled up a little bit and it actually gained weight. So with the Gen 3, you're gonna have weights starting at 456 to 487, depending on which model you have, which means that the Gen 3 is 24 pounds heavier than Gen 2 and 44 pounds heavier than Gen 1. So it's kind of interesting to see that it got heavier. Uh, we're going to take this thing out and we'll see if the weight makes a difference on the road, makes it harder off-road and all of that stuff. Another thing that's basically the same is the motor and transmission. So it's still the 650cc thumper that we've grown to know and love. Um, they did change the cam profiles a little bit. Uh, it's supposed to give a little bit more mid-range power. Um, but other than that, you're still getting that reliable engine. Now with all that being said, from first impressions, it looks like we still have the affordable dependable KLR that's known throughout the world. Uh, but I wanna know, did all these changes make a difference on the bike in how it performs, how it feels off-road, on-road, and all of that? So let's get on the bike and find out. Okay, here we are. So first things to probably address is there are some ergo things that changed on the bike. Uh, the swing arm is actually a little bit longer. So the idea was to help with stability on-road and off-road. And then the bike is actually about 0.7 inches shorter than the old Gen 2 KLR. So for anyone that has shorter legs, you're gonna like to hear that. Um, Kawasaki also offers even a lower seat that you can buy as an aftermarket accessory or an OEM aftermarket accessory. Um, other than that, I mean, you can kind of see it's just the same old KLR. They did change the subframe, so we're excited about that. because It's supposed to make it more, um, be able to carry more weight. Now, when I turn the bike on, um, you can see our digital display now. Like I mentioned earlier, there is no temp gauge or tachometer. So all you're getting is speed, your mileage, and fuel, as well as a clock. So far, so good. Uh, we've done about 100 miles just in setting up this video and breaking the bike in. Um, and so we're getting pretty, I'm getting pretty comfortable on the bike. Fuel injection as far as starting has been on point and the throttle response is actually pretty good. I don't know, it's probably better than the carburetor, but I don't know by how much, it's not gonna be that big of a difference. But um, also things with ergos, um, 
you know, a big thing with the old KLRs is people talk about the handlebar height. The handlebar height on this one is actually not too bad. I'm about 6'2", and when I stand up, it's definitely a little ways down there, uh, but it's not terrible in stock form. So, you know, you might, you might want to get a little bit more of a sit-up style handlebar or maybe get some rock risers or something like that. But I think in stock form, it's, it's actually pretty good. I don't know if they changed the bar height, but I don't mind it. Um, some other things going on with the ergonomics is uh, the seat. So they did change the seat material, and so far it's been pretty comfortable. Um, no complaints there. I don't think the, sh the, the seat, the shape isn't that different, but the foam is a lot better. So it's pretty, it's like decently narrow right up on the front. And then it's pretty wide on the back for when you get in the highway st sections. <laughs> um, a big thing. So we're in some pretty good off-road here. This is some pretty steep, rocky stuff that we're going to hit right at the beginning. Um, some things to note. Uh, the rubber-mounted foot pegs. Well, they're rubber pegs and they're rubber-mounted. Uh, these things are terrible for anything that's serious off-roading. Um, they're really inconsistent feeling and just feel really vague and almost make it harder to stand up. Um, but if you're on the road, they're pretty comfortable. Uh, all the rubber mounted stuff, so you've got the handlebars are rubber mounted. We've got um, the pegs are rubber mounted as well as there's some rubber mounting on the seat. They actually did a really good job with all that stuff. If you're just commuting on this stuff, on the KLR and maybe doing some dirt roads every once in a while, you're gonna love it because as long as you don't squeeze your knees to the tank you can barely feel the vibration of that 650 thumper uh, and that was that's pretty impressive so if you're not doing serious off-roads like the, the way it's set up is actually pretty good i'd be interested um to take off the rubber pegs and just put a like a solid peg um, but keep the rubber mounting underneath and see how that feels see if it gives you a better foot plant but still give you some of that vibration dampening without making it feel really vague when you're standing up. Um, but we're probably gonna go after seeing if we can maybe get a more solid mount for the pegs because you know just in stuff like this where it's you're standing up, you're working hard on the bike, um, you just you just want to have a solid feel on the on your feet. Now another thing, this isn't with ergonomics, this is more of a protection aspect. Um, going through these big rocks makes me think about that drain bolt underneath so it's still the same old drain bolt that's super exposed uh, it sits behind the skid plate and it sits even lower than the skid plate so going through these big rocks I'm pretty careful to not ding that because I don't want to bash the case in um, so there are some stuff you can do for that uh, Tusk has a low profile drain bolt which is a super good accessory for solving that issue um, so there's things like that that'll make it easier to solve that issue and even just a better skid plate as well now as far as handling on the new KLR I actually think they did a pretty good job with the suspension so I think it definitely is better than the 14.5 suspension um, not by a ton but definitely definitely good uh, the valving is a little bit better where you don't bottom out so easy now if you have in the back, I think if you have luggage on, you're uh, you're still going to be pretty pretty prone to bottoming that thing out. Um, but just riding it without luggage, it's actually pretty good. I've hit a couple G outs already. That uh, ooh, it's getting gnarly in here. Um, <laughs> I've hit a couple G outs that I hit a little bit harder on purpose and didn't find the bottom surprisingly, and I was expecting to. Uh, so. It's pretty good in that regard, and I have supposedly the Traveler and Adventure versions of the bike, they have an even stiffer spring in the back for a better weight capacity. Uh, I will say this though, it is still pretty bouncy feeling, so if you hit some of these G outs or hit something hard, it definitely, it rebounds pretty hard, and you'll be bouncing a little bit, especially if you have luggage on. Um, but overall, I, I do like the, the better feeling suspension for sure. Um, along with the suspension, I'm not sure if it's just the rubber mounted accessories or the tires, um, but in this tight off-road stuff, it definitely feels a little bit 
uh, just vague again. It's, you know, you just don't feel as much precision. I'm starting to get used to the bike a little bit better where it's not as big of a deal. Uh, but I definitely started feeling that when I first got into the tighter stuff. It's just, you don't have as much precision in the front and just with steering and feeling like when you turn the handlebars, it's gonna go where you want. Now along with the handling again is the tires. So it's a Dunlop K750s. Uh, perfectly decent tire on the street. Uh, good for some dirt road stuff. Um, but if you're doing, again, serious off-roading and adventure riding, you're gonna want something bigger. Um, so just something better. I've definitely noticed in some of this downhill stuff, it's been a little bit sketchy just trying to uh, just trying to get traction and get the back tire to stop and stuff and have a little bit more confidence in the tires. So I think that's just a preference thing uh, for, you know, use it for whatever use you have. So the last thing that's probably worth mentioning when it comes to handling is the weight. So 24 pounds heavier than Gen 2 with this base model. I mean, that's a lot. Um, it's a bummer that it ended up being heavier uh but it's not that bad honestly it's without luggage it's just kind of the old tank klr that you expect um you know i'm sure a lot of that weight comes from the fuel injection system but also the exhaust and the, the canister and all of that stuff um so it might have just been stuff that had to happen also reinforcing the rear frame to the main frame um so yeah, it's a bummer and there's, you know, there's probably going to be some ways to line things up. But honestly, I mean, I've been riding this all day. On the street, it feels great. There's, like, this is just an awesome commuter for the price point and being able to take it off road when you want to. Uh, it's great for just the average person who just wants to commute and just cruise around every once in a while. Um, in the dirt, I'm definitely starting to feel the weight a little bit, you know, especially we're out here getting riding shots and turning around and stuff or even if the ground's a little bit low on the one side and the kickstand starts leaning over it's you know it's decently heavy but right now in this kind of terrain where it's just a dirt two track ish road uh it's it's fine i, I think it's great um that along with the suspension just being the classic suspension that just kind of plops over everything uh, yeah, I don't I don't think it's a deal breaker and I don't think you notice it too much since it is I feel like it's really low like the center of gravity is just really low with the weight So definitely worth mentioning and talking about and some people might feel it, but I don't think it's a deal breaker by any means Now moving on to the transmission and the engine so Obviously we got fuel injection now and so people are gonna want to know is it better? Is it faster? Is it smoother? Um, as far as it being smoother on the throttle, I think it is mildly, but it's nothing, it's not like a world of a difference. It's, it's smooth and it's reactive, um, but where the motor characteristics haven't really changed too much, they did change those cam profiles, like I mentioned, for some better mid-range. Um, as far as how much that did and if it's noticeable, uh, I don't know. It still feels like a classic KLR. You know, it lugs really well. It's a tractor and it seems like it just revs forever. You know, you can just be in fourth gear or something and be going 30 miles an hour and kind of chugging it and then just get on the gas and it'll, it'll take a while, but it'll just slowly ramp up and won't really hesitate on the way up. So it's still got that classic KLR feel, which I think, you know, for all of you guys that maybe have an older one and you're just looking for something fresh, but you love the way your KLR feels, this is gonna be awesome. It's not gonna feel foreign at all, and you're gonna like just the regular old nature of the KLR. So that's awesome. Um, one thing I did notice with the transmission is again, it's, a very, it's still the same, and first gear is just really fast. So um, when you let out the clutch and you're just idling with the clutch out, you're going usually about eight to nine miles per hour which is pretty fast. So if you get in some technical terrain and some steep uphills, you know, you might abuse the clutch a little bit. Uh, but again, you got that tractor motor that just kind of helps out a lot. So uh, not nothing crazy, but something worth mentioning. Another thing along with kind of the engine transmission and fuel system is the gas tank. So it's still the same 6.1 gallon gas tank. They did redesign it a little bit, reshape it, so that it would work with the fuel injection. 
um, and they're saying that with the way the pump is no longer you're gonna have to shake the bike a little bit back and forth to try and get the last few ounces of fuel in it it should run through the entire tank um, without having to do that um, as far as fuel economy goes we're still kind of testing on that we might comment on it later I've done 112 miles on this um, we filled it up about at about 15 miles so we're about 100 miles on this tank and it's gone down two bars so um, I think you're gonna get a pretty similar gas mileage you know this bike's still breaking in so it might be the break-in fuel mileage um, but I'm guessing it'll be pretty similar to what you're getting on a carburetor. So we'll keep doing the testing. We'll run this thing out and see what the mileage is. Um, but it seems pretty, I mean, well, it's actually just to be determined, to be honest. All right, moving on. Let's uh, talk about the brakes. So the front brake, it went from a 280 millimeter disc to a 300 millimeter disc. So that should give some more bite up front. And in the back, they made a wider rear pad. Um, and I would definitely say it's better. Is it like light years better? Nope. But, um, you know, it's a good, good braking power with one finger and you can lock it. I can lock it up with two fingers on the street. So, uh, at least with the front brake. So there is some grab there. Um, again, between like the rubber mounted stuff and these tires, uh, it was a little bit hard to gauge in the dirt, how the brake, how well the brakes worked just because the tires would start breaking loose so soon. Um, and something also about the ABS version that should be noteworthy is, uh, we're about to get on the street here, is with the ABS version, you actually cannot turn the ABS off, but I heard that they've designed it in a way that you can actually skid for a second before the ABS actually kicks in. So if you're in the dirt, you know, you might be able to have that comfort of being able to skid on purpose a little bit before it starts activating the, the ABS. And now that we're on the street, uh, there's a couple things again, I'll, I'll just kind of point out. So again, vibration wise, all the rubber dampening stuff, the pegs, the seat, the handlebars, like the vibration's almost gone. Um, if you don't, uh, like I said before, if I put my knees against the tank, you can feel the thumper, you know, you can feel that vibration coming through. Even in the mirrors, like these are, these mirrors have been extended out a little bit. Um, but you can see the vibration in the mirrors like it's not really a clear picture of what's behind you um, So that vibration is definitely still there. You can even see it right now in the dash um, it seems like the The bike was definitely smoother with the vibration for the first probably 50 miles and now that it's kind of breaking into the next 50 um, The vibration is a little bit more but other than you know with the rubber mounted stuff. It's awesome. Uh, another thing worth mentioning about being on the street is the windscreen. So it's an adjustable windscreen. Uh, right now it's in the lowest position, but you can take the windscreen off, move the brackets up. I think it's like 30 millimeters higher. Um, so with me sitting like this, I'm about, again, 6'2", and I can feel the wind all the way right above um, my chin bar if I'm sitting up straight. So that's about where it's hitting me. It's off my chest. Um, it is hitting my shoulders. So I think it's actually really well designed. I'm, I'd be interested to see how much of a difference it makes when you raise it up. Um, it might get it so it's just right above your eyebrows, maybe. Um, so you could probably just duck behind it, especially if maybe you're a smaller rider. It might just blow right over your head and you won't have to deal with um, your helmet buffeting at all. Uh, as far as buffeting on the freeway, uh, it's not bad at all. I think it actually does a really good job on the freeway speeds. Um, if you do get behind like a semi or something and get in their, their airstream, you definitely start feeling the shake a little bit and it's not quite as smooth. But I actually really like the way this is designed. I don't think, I mean, unless you want to, obviously, I don't think an aftermarket one is gonna be that much better unless you're looking for one that's a lot taller that's gonna complete, completely take the wind off of your body. So uh, I like what they did there. Now, one gripe I do have about the KLR, at least this new one, is these fairings up in front. So within about the first uh, 25 miles, actually it might've been the first 10 miles, something in them started rubbing together and it started making this really like squelchy sound. Um, and it's been going on pretty much all day 
and uh, I, we thought maybe there was something going on with the motor or something like that but uh, on the ride today I've jammed my knees up against the plastic fairings and it stopped so there's something in there that's going on and it's just like plastic rubbing together that's making a kind of annoying sound so if you're not at highway speeds or you're not listening to music you can hear that and it might be unique to just this model um, and, but I, just something worth mentioning that we are seeing in this first impressions now to start wrapping things up I wanted to talk to you guys about some of the OEM accessories so if you get the traveler edition or model or the adventure model your bike will come with a lot of these OEM accessories that Kawasaki is offering. So they have things like the auxiliary light bar with the two uh, fog lights up in front. Um, they have uh, frame guards. So there's like a frame rails that go along the sides. Um, there's a USB socket that goes here and a DC tw or 12 volt DC power that goes here as well as your auxiliary light switch goes there. Um, you can buy all of those things. Um, oh, there's also the lower seat that I talked about, as well as the uh, Kawasaki side panniers. Um, so you can buy all of that stuff separately, like say if you get the, the base model and you want to upgrade later. Um, I will say that they are pretty expensive. You know, they do have grip heaters even. Like the grip heaters are about 200 bucks. Uh, the auxiliary light setup is about $400. The aftermarket seat, I think, was close, like between two and $300. So it is a little bit expensive. Um, I wouldn't say that that matches kind of the KLR aesthetic, at least the, the general market. But if you like OEM accessories that you know are just going to fit and be designed for the bike, you know, they've got them. And we've got them on our website as well. So don't hesitate to pick that stuff up if you are so inclined. Um, now let's talk about aftermarket stuff. So a lot of the stuff we've talked about already, we're going to start addressing. So. We're going to go after things like the rubber mounted pegs and see if we can get a solid mount option for you guys. We're going to start with, uh, we're going to get some pannier racks. So get some luggage options for the back and so you can mount up your luggage. Other things we're going to tackle is the doohickey spring. So, you know, like we said before, the spring is still not up to snuff. So we're going to go ahead, we're going to probably put one of the Eagle Mike uh, do hickeys in there and uh, get that thing settled so we don't have to worry about it anymore Other things we'll probably tackle is you know tires uh, These ones just are good for the street, but not good for the off-road stuff we do So we'll be definitely like I said putting some D sports on there get a little bit more aggressive to uh, tread underneath the bike now another gripe I have about uh, the new KLR and this is just something that's been with all the KLRs it's just that shifter is still just too short. If you're wearing anything other than tennis shoes, it's really hard to get your boot underneath there and shift. So, um, you know, just one of those things that just still kind of an oversight, kind of unfortunate. Um, but fortunately, there's plenty of aftermarket options to remedy that little oversight. So we're back in the shop and there's a couple things that we found on the KLR after getting off the bike that I wanted to show you. So. One significant change is they've changed the way that the bike reads speed. So rather than being it off the front wheel, they've now changed it so the speed sensor is off of the counter shaft. So this sensor, it's based off of that four-sided nut right there. And what this means for you is that if you do change the gearing on the KLR, your bike speed will no longer be accurate. So something to keep in mind. Also, this is a 15 tooth sprocket and it's pretty jammed in here. There's not a lot of extra space against the, the crankcase. So you won't, probably won't be able to gear up on the front, so you have to do it with the back. Um, another thing that is kind of noteworthy that I forgot to talk about is the fairings. So just like the Gen 2, these fairings are really expensive uh, to replace. So we will definitely be going after getting some new crash bars set up for these so you can keep these in good shape. And then there's something on the gauge I want to show you guys as well. So earlier in the video, I talked about how there's no temp gauge on the new KLR. We did find out though that there is a temp sensor. So when you first turn the key on, you'll see this red light turn on as well as these indicators. So if the bike gets too hot or the battery uh, has too little or too much voltage, that red light will turn on and it'll show you which one is the problem. So it's nice to see that we have a sensor. We just don't have the gauge to tell you exactly what the temperature is. So a couple things we found out after the fact. Now let's send you back to me on the bike and we'll wrap up my thoughts on the KLR. Okay, so with all of that said, here's my thoughts on the new 2022 KLR. 650 
you know, I would argue that it's not quite as utilitarian as it was before. So with the fuel injection, you know, you might be carrying around fuses instead of jets. Um, and that just the utilitarian aspect that people appreciate about this is, it's, you know, it's easy to fix. It's, it breaks down on the trail. It's easy to find parts, you know, world, like basically across the world. I think a lot of those characteristics, it still has actually. You just have fuel injection now. Um, I do like the improved suspension. Uh, I do like that uh, it is really smooth. Um, but I would say that for all of you guys that love the KLR, they didn't ruin it. <laughs> it's still the same, pretty much the same old KLR, just with some minor improvements. So some of you guys may not like that. You know, there are a lot of people that wanted a complete redesign. They wanted that, but I think it's maybe it's hard to get a complete redesign and keep it at the price point it is. You know, between basically 6,500 bucks and 8,000 dollars brand new. I think they're still doing a really good job with holding that space in the market. This is still a really great gateway adventure bike. Uh, it's great for beginners to get started and it's great for the guys that just want long range comfort and go on long adventure rides. You know, I wouldn't, it wouldn't be my first choice, but I wouldn't hesitate to take this on any of our adventure rides. You know, it'll make you work for it for sure, but it'll do it. And that's what's awesome about the KLRs. You can kind of do everything and anything it's not going to do it the best. It's not going to do it the worst. It's just perfectly decent at everything. So, you know, it's just, it is, it's the KLR. So, um, I love it. I think it's got an awesome place in the market. And uh, I'm stoked to see what we can do to this thing to make it even better in the future. So, if you want to stay tuned and see what we come out with shortly with our parts, with the build on this thing, make sure and subscribe. Make sure to comment below. Uh, you know, do you like the do you like the new KLR? Do you like the looks? Do you think they should have gone with more changes, less changes? Uh, let's start the conversation down below, and uh, we'll see you guys out there.